Now you can. Um, April is National Landscape Architecture Month, don't you know? Uh, and um, and uh, that happens every year when I say that. There's always cat calls. Uh, but it is National Landscape Architecture Month. And we're really happy to um, provide several Ball State contributions to this uh, busy national recognition. Uh, and I did want to go over a couple things before I let Carla introduce our speaker for the, for the day. Uh, student chapter, uh, ASLA, coordinated by fifth-year students John Helm and Michael Zorick, hosted our first annual Lynx Trust golf outing at the Players Club on April 5th. Seventy golfers, 18 hole sponsors, and over $1,500 was raised uh, to create a fund to benefit students interested in golf course planning and design. Um, the department is pleased to co-host today's lecture by Jane Amidon as part of our uh, National Landscape Architecture Month contribution. Uh, and Jane's lecture will be followed by a reception in the gallery. Uh, the gallery, by the way, if you haven't been in there lately, is uh, filled with the landscape architecture work of Rendell Ernstberger's designs for the Indianapolis Cultural Trail, plans, renderings, full-scale floorscapes, materials, CDs, and a DVD and 3D simulation. So I hope you take some time to take a look at this exciting project, the first leg of which is scheduled to open in Indianapolis this spring. You might also check out the Dean's Wall. I understand there's going to be a scavenger hunt associated with uh, the work that's on the wall uh, to our east, that direction. And um, our National Landscape Architecture Month events will conclude next Monday with our annual Frederick Law Olmsted birthday celebration. You might look for Fred's picture and the invitation uh, a little later in the, in the week. Uh, I'll now let Carla Corbin introduce today's speaker. Okay, tell me if I get too loud back there. I'm pleased to introduce Jane Amadon, who's giving today's presentation in the CAP Speakers series. This is the last lecture for the academic year. Um, as as uh, Malcolm says, this is Landscape Architecture Month, and being here is one way to celebrate the diversity and breadth of, the cont of contemporary park design. Jane is the principal of Amadon Design Communication, a design research and communications practice examining the intersection of large-scale urban and natural systems. Recent projects include a collaborative award-winning proposal for brownfield redevelopment in Columbus, Ohio, and the site design for a business incubator located adjacent to Wet Forest Zone. She's a series editor for Source Books in Landscape Architecture, Princeton Architectural Press, in addition to writing on contemporary landscape arch architecture issues. Her most recent book is Moving Horizon, The Landscape Architecture of Catherine Gustafson and Partners. And the first was Dan Kiley, American's Master Landscape Architect. The latter grew out of her student internship in the Kiley office, which subsequently grew to five years of professional practice at the very distinguished firm. Recent lecture venues include the National Building Museum, the Wexner Center for the Arts, the Royal Institute of British Architecture, and the Netherlands Architecture Institute. She received a master's degree in landscape architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1995, and is currently teaching in the landscape section of the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State University. In her introduction to Radical Landscape, Jane wrote, it is human nature to search out the new, the exciting, the source of energy that will release us from the bonds of the ordinary, the expected, the known, end quote. I think we should expect more from our landscapes and those who design them as we move toward a future that is both exhilarating and frightening. I think Jane's lecture will expand the range of what we might expect. The title of her lecture today is Contemporary Parks, Productive and Seductive. All right, can you hear me in the back? Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the introduction, Carla and Malcolm. Um, the lecture, this lecture is actually a development of earlier work, uh, specifically on contemporary parks and their productive and seductive qualities. So what I'm going to talk about today, big nature, is a set of 
ideas that attempt to capture a larger consideration of landscape as a contemporary attitude uh, of which contemporary parks are a part. So I'm not pulling a fast one on you. This is uh, simply about half a generation later of current research. Uh, another fast one I'm not pulling on you, but as an update is uh, as of January, I'm the chair of the Landscape Architecture Department at Ohio State University. So I'm very uh, interested to find out what you are doing here at Ball State. I think our uh, programs are equivalent in size, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. So uh, I look forward to getting to know the faculty and the students uh, better over the next coming years. So let's talk about big nature. Uh, actually, I'll, one more preface. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, it gives me a chance to look inward at what my current work is, but also to look outward and consider the um, current and near future state of the practice and theory of landscape architecture. So each time I speak, um, I sort of take it as a chance to reconsider where we are now. But I will warn you, when I do that, I'm a historian by training. I'm a contextualist by design. So as I look forward, I often look back over my shoulder. So I'm always trying to provide a kind of context for where we are now and where I think we're going. New merely for the sake of newness isn't as valuable as something that's fresh and innovative and has a critical grounding or a critical framework of a knowledge of where we've come from. So where, oh, I'm also assured by, is it Chris, the AV person, that uh, I'm not seeing double that it's typical to see two of the same screens. I'll be showing just one track of slides, so you can focus on the left or the right. So where is landscape now? Like architecture and urbanism, I believe we're at a moment where pervasive information, its management and implications, is changing how and why we design. As it's described at MoMA's current show, Design in the Elastic Mind, collaboration between science and design is yielding a radical new way of visualizing, understanding, and manipulating a natural world. But for landscape, this is not a revolution, but a renaissance. Although the tools and methods are fresh, the instinct is relatively the same. Environmental prerogatives are very serious business. Like Big Pharma, embracing our collective health paranoia over the past few decades, like Big Tech, thriving on our appetite for intelligence and productivity, there is an emerging big nature that taps into growing fears of our demise at the hands of advancing climate change or cataclysmic culture shock. This big nature is a mashup of environmental and social agendas. Big nature builds upon a preceding generation of remediation work. An example of this are the recent spate of metropolitan scaled parks which reconfigure residues of 20th century urban, military, and industrial operations. This slide, uh, as labeled, is from the Fresh Kills proposal by Field Operations. And this scale of metropolitan parks, or large parks, was recently um, extensively discussed at the Large Parks Conference, actually not so recently, but the recently published book, Large Parks, uh, edited by Julia Zerniak and George Hargraves. Have any of you had the chance to check that book out? Well, you should. It's a fairly comprehensive coverage of uh, this important, not new, and maybe won't last very long, but this important phase of contemporary landscape architecture. So big nature realizes that while this is a fairly um, uh, significant phase or attitude towards how and why we design a series of motivations about how we rework our public landscapes, Big Nature realizes that this kind of work will soon be obsolete. Once developed economies sufficiently clean up and phase away the collateral contamination of the industrial era. Already in landscape and related disciplines, close attention is being paid to practices that preempt the need for remediation. We are reimagining the historically destructive activities of resource extraction, refinement, production, distribution, and post-user consolidation 
as interdependent modes in which the output or waste of one process is harnessed as the input or nutrient for others. Dematerialization, decarbonization, and life cycle design have gained traction as economically feasible, environmentally pragmatic, and culturally rewarded strategies. As the practice of landscape moves beyond reclamation to big nature, there's a proactive rather than a reactive stance. The paradigm is shifting to doing from fixing. Sites are producers, living systems linked into supply and demand networks, dealing with food and water security, renewable energy resources, and climate change. This highly literal land use as landscape differs significantly from the preceding generation's passive surfaces of amelioration and leisure. Today, open space systems are increasingly geared toward a fusion of economic, social, and environmental vitalization, such as Detroit's Urban Farms Program, with 50% of residential lots, or nearly 50%, abandoned in the urban core, Detroit has thousands of idle acres, recently hundreds of which have come under cultivation. As part of this effort, the American Coalition of Black Farmers and its partners are prototyping a farming education slash community market to create local jobs and to teach urban youth about healthy lifestyles and sustainability. According to local participants, the hybridization of social engagement and productive landscape has the potential to evolve Metro Detroit into, quote, a suburban ring around a re-ruralized core. Similarly, in Chicago, the Department of Transportation Green Alleys campaign aims to replace conventional surfaces with pervious pavements and 1,900 miles of urban alleyways. These changes will improve stormwater filtration, reduce heat island effects, and complement the city's other landscape initiatives, such as the simple but potent act of planting more street trees. The US Forest Service reports that in Chicago, tree canopies alone reduce stormwater runoff by four to eight percent by intercepting rain and allowing it to evaporate. Here the idea of public space has been expanded to include amenities for people and the environment. It's not a new idea, but it's one that we're revisiting now. We haven't revisited it for several generations. Public lands have not undergone a paradigm shift this consequential since the advent of the National Park Service around a century ago. Then the movement was in response to intensifying rates of land consumption at the dawn of an era of technocracy. Preservation would create a vast land bank for future generations. Now the change in attitude takes advantage of emerging environmental technologies to once again realign our relationship to nature. But this time, instead of passively protecting it in far off places, we are actively building an enhanced nature around our daily existence that fuels, filters, feeds, and otherwise fosters healthier communities. Novel priorities are established by generative landscapes, such as this synthetic marsh that monitors contamination with fiber optics. This is an image from the recently published book, Living Systems. Uh, editors Liat Margolis and Alexander Robinson, another great read if you haven't seen it yet. With this synthetic marsh, the bundled strands glow as levels of phosphorus and nitrogen rise, and at the same time provide surface area for microorganisms to feed and support a fish habitat. Novel priorities are established by carbon dioxide eating biofuel producing algae operations. Algae has theoretical oil yields of up to 10,000 gallons per acre. And although it has specific temperature requirements, it grows relatively easily in fresh, brackish, and saline water. So for example, in a desert southwest, where much of the groundwater is saline and unsuitable for other forms of agriculture, algae can proliferate. So as this sort of work attempts to strike a balance between land as a set of material properties and landscape as a venue for cultural dialogue, 
it's important to note that these operations are indeed infinitely scalable. In this case, the algal medium thrives on carbon dioxide emitted by activities as large as a coal power plant shown on the left and as small as an individual's choices about their daily routine shown on the right. Rather than fencing off wilderness tracks as the unspoiled far landscape, a prized geographic figure, or remediating parcels at the urban periphery, the imperiled close landscape, efforts are coalescing around ecological innovation as a civic action, the entrepreneurial landscape, a big hybrid of environmental conditions and social agendas. But as entrepreneurial big nature becomes the go-to landscape, a looming question is, dot, 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 how will public space change in response? And more specifically, how will public parks as a design typology and landscape architecture change in response? What are their productive and seductive characteristics and how will they be cultivated and managed? Well, one aspect is clear and that is that matter matters. Increasingly, it will be matter, productive and seductive, to a degree that nature is not docile and controlled, but rather governed by a potent interaction of natural and human forces. The typological silhouette of landscape will continue to blur, shifting from an objectified spatial terrain to a subjective state, one substantiated by a capacity to produce localized benefits and experiential atmospheres through active management of ecological media. For evidence of this shift in attitude towards site matter, compare the 1985 transformation of an obsolete landfill outside of Palo Alto with a 2007 proposal to reclaim marshland at the entrance of the New York, New Jersey Harbor. And what we're looking at here, both images are from uh, Hargraves Associates Bixby Park the 1985 transformed landfill. So the earlier park reconfigured topography and surface conditions in order to craft a new identity for the site. Rotting debris and contaminated soils were capped, then referenced with small undulations planted with untended meadow grasses. Five art installations called attention to site dynamics such as weather, light, and the passage of time. In comparison, instead of signifying the status of out of commission matter with static analogs, the marshlands proposal from 2007 creates zones of ecological tension encompassing an urban park. These ecotones reanimate salt marshes degraded by decades of fill and dredging and then scale upward to integrate with Jamaica Bay. Microcosms of habitats, program, and landform are born from the intersection of dynamic material behaviors and armatures for public circulation. The project represents environmental engineering writ large, a civil civic typology that mixes high rationalism with the romance of societal gain, echoing public works of the WPA and CCC era. Formal organizations and aesthetic implications are not conceptual drivers but are byproducts of the living system, of splicing production techniques into existing site ecologies to amplify positive environmental effects. Just one year ago, critic and landscape architect Richard Weller pointed out that, quote, landscape architecture is yet to have its own modernism, an ecological modernity, an ecology free of romanticism and aesthetics. So because of its high functionalism, one is tempted to understand this next generation of big nature landscapes as a kind of eco-modernism. But I really think that would be a misreading. They are the anti-master plan. Scalable, not monolithic. Market-driven, not utopian. And strongly contextual due to their reliance on the performance of native ecologies. To flourish, these big nature landscapes will need to appeal, if not to our sense of romance, at least to our sensibility 
about how decisions made today impact the future. We are no longer innocent. Contemporary culture is coming to grips with the Anthropocene epic, a period which Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen suggests began in the late 1700s with the onslaught of fueled human activity. The onus of our new environmentalism includes a call for an advanced stewardship that is not just about protection, but a redefinition of our relationship to nature. But still, the question remains of this approach. How will we relate to big nature differently than the preceding eras of preservation and remediation? Before examining this question in more detail, I think it's important to note that operative ecologies, the working landscape, the productive landscape, has long been at the heart of human settlement. Only during the machine age was working nature held apart vigorously from the civic realm. The notion of urban parks as oases offering escape from the pressures of the city is certainly at odds with earlier millennia of shared landscape as the nexus of human effort, technos, and ecology, oikos. Although large-scale environmental systems played a role in the foundation of most cities, for example, water bodies for transit, landform for prospect and protection, geologic plant and animal communities for industry, etc. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, working ecological media were routinely outcompeted by the notion of a sublime nature, allowing modernizing nations to consume natural resources with minimal guilt, so long as a version of the pristine far landscape was preserved. In this period, ecologic media were understood as little more than utility or raw materials versus ideology, the regional asceticism of, for example, Emerson's Transcendentalists or the Hudson River School. By the 1950s, ecology took on the role of industrial victim, its threatened state of health becoming a poster child for protectionism. Backlash set in, and in the US, changes in the Environmental Protection Agency's regulation standards, as well as influential figures such as Ian McCarg, fed the public sphere of nature side. So nearing the end of the century, it was clear that both stances, all-out consumption and guilt-driven protection, would serve to distance ecological realism from intellectually and materially compelling landscape practice. But by the 1980s, there were signs that the oppositional relationship of technos to oikos was beginning to soften. As reclamation became a pervasive project type in Europe and the United States, remediation became both a design task and a new public forum. At the same time, renewed interest in the land art movement provided a model for instability in the designed landscape. Actions such as inundation, deposition, and erosion offered a metaphoric language as well as a morphologic formalism that differentiated postmodernism in landscape from architecture. So we jumped from, we skipped modernism and we jumped from a sort of industrial stance into postmodernism and landscape, and we can talk about that more later. <laughs> By this time, sufficient distance had been gained from the radical determinism of McCargian methods to permit a re-engagement with working nature in a critical manner. For example, Millrace Park in Columbus, Indiana, not too far from here. How many of you have been to Columbus, Indiana? Great. Okay, so a number of you hopefully have been to Millrace Park, which as you encounter it, if you haven't studied it um, at length, it seems pretty subtle. <laughs> and as one of Michael Van Valkenburg's first major projects, uh, I think he's been accused of, of having not taken an explicit enough design stance on the landscape. But I think actually Millrace Park stands as an excellent example of the beginning of a re-engagement with ecological media in a critical manner. So here's why. Millrace Park speaks simultaneously of a genus loci, an authenticity of place revealed by the performance of regional matter, such as water, uh, native species. It speaks simultaneously of that and of abstraction via the introduction of idealized form 
the park does not simply observe its hydrological context. It participates through an overlay of two sibling systems, the city grid and the meandering river. These systems are punctuated by two non sequitur, non -sequitur geometries, the round lake and the crescent amphitheater. The landforms facilitate the transfiguration of ground from a field condition when dry to a collection of objects when flooded. The Euclidean clarity of the circle is a foil for the irregularity of the nearby wetland. The amphitheater defines the primary open space of the park, and when flooded, it measures water levels. These acontextual geometries are significant because their aberrance sends several messages. First, they can be read as aggressively postmodern, iconic snippets reassembled as eclectic surface elaboration. But they go deeper. Their deviant formal perfection is the very thing that allows hydrologic action to register within the park frame as a civil discourse between culture and nature. The circular lake and crescent amphitheater are not so much about stasis and figuration but about configuring grounds for flux in the landscape. And in this role, at the time they signal the transition in practice and theory towards increased interest in the revelation of site process as civicness, as well as the poetics of regional materials, here explored as a framing and an exaggeration of the characteristics of water and vegetation. At Mill Race, geometry is intervention, not structure. Via abstraction, isolated moments call forth meaning from the surrounding otherness. A second reason why these aberrant geometries are important is because unlike the other predominant features of the site, like those follies or the historic figures such as the covered bridge, unlike those, the circle and the crescent are fairly neutral coordinates. They're not really of the river and they're not really of the city. They're without historic identity, and they're not strictly defined active program. Because of this, they establish a unique locus for the park. The figures are topographic registrations that question the truth of the ground plane. The lake is excavated, establishing an alternate surface of water in place of solid earth. The amphitheater is molded from the spoils of the lake. Its elevation presents a masculine profile of addition upon the existing site surface in counterbalance to the subtractive feminine contour of the lake basin. This dialectic plays out too in the operative protocols of the two components. The lake is linked to the wetland and to the larger river system. Thus its water fluctuates in volume and turbidity according to the region's hydrologic. On calm days, the smooth lake surface reflects the sky with startling lucidity. In contrast, the crescent landform is clothed in rooted, opaque turf. The growth and dormancy phases of the grass are artificially modified through acts of mowing, aeration, fertilization, irrigation. The culturated materiality of the landform surface, regulated by a municipal schedule and budget, represents control. It is a swelled section of the domesticated suburban plain. Meanwhile, the lake waters reflect a complex, less managed relationship to nature, particularly as its content is an ever-changing mix of agricultural and urban detritus filtered through the intricate wetlands. The lake maintains a minimum depth, but during flood events, the water level rises, creating a thickened aqueous section that temporarily detains flood water before submitting to greater forces, losing control and overflowing into surrounding open parklands. So moving forward, back to big nature, or the framework for big nature. By the 1990s, landscape architecture as a critical practice had established process as a design motivation and began to appropriate ecological principles from the field of landscape ecology, principles such as adaptive, the adaptive cycle or the intermediate disturbance theory. These appropriated principles push landscape to re-examine its disciplinary roots and to further wean itself from architectural and art discourse. 
But without the preceding quarter century of reclamation commissions, landscape would not have had many of the eco-technology tools, such as phytoremediation, it was just then beginning to use. So we can't have not gone through any of these phases to get to where we are about to be. At this point in the late 90s, the practice and theory was just beginning to imagine using environmental technology as a tool for big nature. And in addition to these tools, there were specific design strategies introduced and explored in the preceding period of reclamation that provided a foundation for big nature. And I'd like to talk about those just briefly. Basically, between the brackets of Richard Haig's Gasworks Park, which was one of the first in the US implemented on uh, industrially contaminated grounds, and the High Line in New York, the adaptive reuse of an elevated rail line, uh, the first phase of which is going to open this year, four strategies characterized significant remediative practices. The first, inhabiting. The strategy of inhabiting includes architectural and or horticultural intervention within an armature of obsolete production and refinement processes. It includes refiguration of contaminated grounds to programmatized plane. It includes juxtaposition of then versus now as scenographic and narrative devices. A second strategy, repurposing, includes structural and material rehabilitation, negotiation of oscillations in economic and ecologic cycles, and adjusting public perceptions by engaging, quote, spaces that are internal to the city but external to its everyday uses. A third strategy, transforming, includes reclamation projects predicated on instrumentalized ecology. That is, the grounds were initially arranged in the static old geometries of the day, but then intentionally transitioned over time. So really these projects became four-dimensional. Change over time was anticipated by the design. And the project that we see here, the shell project by West 8, for example, weathered from one configured materiality, the large bands of black versus white shells, into a second materiality, eventually dunes of sand. Transforming includes an increasingly literal response to the physical environment. It incorporates cycles of event and recovery. It embraces these and attempts to reveal them as opposed to using design to defend against them. And it represents, at last, a critical shift to the territory of city and region as opposed to objects and site. The fourth category, calibrating, was really what we saw coming into play by the late 1990s with the larger scale uh, metropolitan parks. Particularly those cast as models for the 21st century parks, such as um, Downsview in Toronto or uh, Fresh Kills Landfill to Landscape. And what we see here is one of the finalist proposals for Fresh Kills. These projects, as I mentioned earlier, increasingly looked to ecological theory as a paradigm for meta site process and for emergent program. These works were increasingly large, geographically and combinatory. They were characterized by phasing and protocols, or most simply, there is no site plan. Material management replaces a spatio-formal practice. Design becomes a geotemporal matrix of ingredients. Additionally, this fourth category of work reveals a leakage between techniques of representation, such as sampling, montage, and indexing, and modes of speculation, such as adaptive program and material protocols. Their tactical aesthetics are reminiscent to some of superrealism, a term first used by Malcolm Morley in the mid-1960s. According to Tissot in the book Myth and Ideology in American Culture, aspects of superrealism include aggressiveness, tension, fabricated reality, representation on representation to constitute an everyday heroic iconography. So through the lens of Photoshop, Illustrator, and Flash, the banality of trees growing squirrels nesting, and families picnicking gained programmatic status, 
nature's authenticity was very much in vogue. And as a side note, I can't help but see a bit of edible, <laughs> edipal, not edible, edipal irony in this. Um, I haven't used the, the term landscape urbanism, but this fourth category is really a landscape urbanism. And I, I see the tendency of borrowing uh, paradigms and ecological uh, models from landscape ecology, yet refusing to truly use them as an applied science in the ground as uh, a sort of not a uh, questionable revelation of a desire to sublimate applied ecology, to jump into bed with the post-Fordist metropolis. And I think that's probably the, the biggest problem with landscape urbanism at this point in time, although there are others. So this cohort of practices which emerged in the era of remediation now stand to influence how we will shape and use the coming entrepreneurial environment of big nature. But in balance to this optimism, we have to mention a critique of the first three strategies, is the persistence of the picturesque, the figural topography, the amplified materiality, and the signification of artifacts, mixed with the te tectonics of entropy and Smithson's industrial heroic, risk reducing these landscapes to nostalgia. And of course, the critique of the fourth strategy centers on the problematics of incrementalism the process plus time model of phasing and material management results in a level of indeterminacy that theoretical inquiry, public attention spans, and budget cycles simply cannot sustain. So, big nature, what is it? What are its productive and seductive characteristics? And why do we care? Looking beyond the remediation era that we're currently in, but soon to come out of, it's clear that big nature will have less and less to do with fixing environmental contamination and more to do with how we redefine public space. A current generation of design practices commandeers ecological instruments as a means of economy and public participation. How are these landscapes strategized and visualized? A handful of recent competitions and conferences speak to the potential of cultivating living systems within the civic realm, and several common aspects are apparent. First, these landscapes tend to be extroverted or interconnected. Big nature plays out as a continuous productive regional landscape, as constellations that share gravities, not necessarily networked, a terror of the new sublime, and that is exponential global connectivity, propels the development of living systems as the new local. If the failure of earlier urban design and regionally scaled enterprises was the oversimplification of the phenomenological richness of physical life, then projective socioecologies or big nature must produce extroverted content in the race for consumer attention it must exacerbate its identity and claim user participation or lose relevancy. Secondly, big nature is consensual or effective and operative simultaneously. At the heart of these landscapes is an immersion of information, ecology, and technology in a way that blurs distinction between the natural and the artificial, and that's very important because it can be understood as an argument for the realignment of self in relation to a post 20th century nature technology hybrid. The ubiquity of connectivity plus opportunism of ecotech will result in super customizable program habitats capable of responding in real time to the acuity of smart mobs and the charisma of big nature. The information phenomena seduces by inviting a kind of participation that prioritizes sensation as information. And there are a lot of current IT tools that we're using as uh, ways to gather, transmit data, and these are becoming a type of sensory stimulation. So consensual big nature fine tunes our cultural mores to allow using information and environmental technology 
uh, horticultural, geological, hydrological, and related agendas to weigh equally with development agendas. And we're able to do this using IT and ecotech because suddenly we can gather data that wasn't readily apparent to us. When we have the information, we can start to equalize the agendas. Site is understood as a series of layers that vary in stability and permanence. As design layers are added to a site, they become stitched together with elements of location and orientation. Particularly in the project you're looking at here, degrees of stability are achieved through some elements of permanence, while material states and shift of program can occur. So at varying scales, Big Nature uses social networking and geographic information systems to create modes of exchange and of administration of the landscapes. Depending on who uses the site when and for what purpose, varying kinds of information are gathered that allow for individualizing of place. Program is thought of as a fabric topology. It is understood as a series of functions which can transform while maintaining a continuum of usages and states. The fabric stretches and is manipulated to create varying organizations without tearing apart. The final layer of sensation is generated via experiential phenomena that result from the intersection of data, time, place, and user. This does become a seductive element of the design while at the same time serving as a productive environment. In a somewhat similar manner, the Scottish firm Grossmax proposes a nuclear-powered iceberg in a town square. To counter global warming, they promote the idea of local freezing. It's a climate interchange that exaggerates perception of nature's intensity, and one's experience within it engenders a highly individualized and fluid idea of urban open space. A new nature emerges that synthesizes subjective landscape experiences with the mandate of sustainable and secure public space, and perhaps creates a balance between human and ecologic agendas. To achieve this transformation slash participation, in necessary contrast to the ambivalency of program, the arrangement and the amplification of topographic, geologic, vegetative, and weather conditions is extremely specific and persistent. These artificially heightened material states are authoritative without being deterministic. They're authored, but to a large degree are feral. They enable exchange and experience the assimilative confrontation between subject and content. It's not so much about processing raw data representing the actual world, but creating fictions to relate the sensations we have and so we each create our own evolving perception of what the world is. And the third characteristic of big nature, plural or multidisciplinary. <clears throat> From GIS, Geographic Information Systems, to BIM, Building Information Modeling. From hybrid super plants to smart skins, buildings, landscapes, and cities are fusing into contiguous systems that are responsive and resilient. This suggests a dissolution of individual design pursuits and at the same time requires extreme disciplinary focus. So what I'm not suggesting here is a post-disciplinary state, which a lot of people are talking about right now, where the boundaries melt away uh, because we're using similar technologies. I'm actually suggesting that to achieve optimal forward progress, we need to be extreme specialists sharing extremely specialized knowledge across uh, highly permeable, but permeable disciplinary boundaries. In this scenario, landscape, architecture, and urbanism are replaced with a new environmentalism that's more broad, that signals not merely a semantic preference, but a rejection of the constraints of autonomy. The trajectory of big nature has become increasingly scalable inward toward the relatively micro scale of material management and outward to the macro scale where the mapping of mobility, communications, and demographics reveal mosaics of exchange. <clears throat> 
with GIS and related applications such as LIDAR, ARC Hydro, Google Earth and equivalents, enabling a kind of macro choreography, the processing of a region's raw materials, its human, ecologic, and economic populations is scripted using either slow equations like zoning codes or quick adaptive algorithms produced by the real-time interaction of goods, consumers, and suppliers. Increasingly, geogenetic instruments enable matter to register its presence across a spectrum of virtual and real environments, ranging from database GPS to user-created content of blogs and social networking. This encourages participation in a new kind of, quote, live, quite live public space. Big nature is a kind of open source environmentalism needs the generosity of multi-scaled material systems to expand, decay, reorganize, and regenerate. As territorial identities are increasingly plastic and energetically branded, proactive ecologies uphold rejection of the passive. So as productive and seductive big nature tests the real-time intersection of urban and natural systems, there are certainly several hurdles to be met. For starters, the modern public has rarely warmed to productive land uses, particularly in the US. Ironically, for an economy founded on land-based industry and agriculture, our preference has strongly tended toward passive scenery as opposed to productive assemblies. A 2006 survey determined that the following words had agreeable associations for 75% of people surveyed about their perception of landscape in descending order, green, natural, tree, flower, sun, water, quiet, blue. And I know you can all read, I read these out loud to you to underline the simplicity of the language against the strength of the reaction in the public. In comparison, the following words had less than 25% of positive associations for the same group of people. Dirt, concrete, industry, hard, gray, rusty, gravel, process, weed, asphalt, dull, closed, loud, wasteful. When asked to give a reason why they ranked particular images and words of working landscapes more poorly than others, Participants selected the following. First, the image was visually displeasing. Second, the land use depicted was a threat to human health. Or third, the land use was a threat to the environment. So here a social factor, human health, ranks above environmental concerns, but both are less influential than expectations of bucolic scenery. As evidenced by this study, while we grapple with issues of utility and accessibility and productivity in the operational landscape, the first is an image problem to be dealt with. But today there's hope that information technologies do have the potential to virally increase awareness of ecologic, social, and economic states, and thereby to link people, place, productivity, and performance. A taller a second hurdle that I think is taller is that the hybrid landscape of nature and technology has to become valued, really, as a public kind of enterprise, or it won't survive as a typology of public space. To promote itself across a gradient of cultural preferences, big nature will need to seduce by providing modes of physical and intellectual participation in addition to production. Applied ecological media the green, blue, and brown stuff must function simultaneously as an ideological mechanism and as applied science long after an inconvenient truth fades from bestseller lists. For years, I've asked my students to think deeply about the concept of nature as both a cultural construct and a set of physical facts. To start, we use a familiar paradigm of first, second, and third nature. First being wilderness or nature undisturbed, nature alone. Second nature, agriculture, which is nature plus man. Third, aesthetics, nature with an overlay of art or leisure or motivations of religion, etc. cetera. 
I proposed to the students two more categories, a fourth nature of industry, which is mechanization, and a fifth nature of post-industry recovery, or reclamation. We conclude by asking, is there a sixth nature? What is next? Responses have ranged, but the most common is a kind of green urbanism, nature as an eco-metropolis of interwoven sustainable systems. However, aside from the prefab eco-cities, such as China's Dongtan Island, this is a relatively futuristic scenario. We will not be able to shed the constraints of our current urban infrastructures for generations to come until our priorities change, allowing concepts of nature and subsequently strategies for land use to evolve. So born from this condition, Big Nature realizes that its social motivation that has until now been the missing link between the reclamation era, fifth nature, and authentically green urbanism, the students' sixth nature. We are just coming to terms with the fact that our landscapes need to arouse the public and create desire to participate, desire to cultivate, desire to advocate. Certainly a key to this rising awareness is that we are in a time of recurring natural catastrophes. Each successive Katrina, tsunami, mudslide, melting ice cap, and drought binds the social aspirations of first, second, and third world economies into a common predicament. The predicament of the commons, also old as human settlement, has grown exponentially since the Industrial Revolution. Loosely described, it is about unfettered demand for finite natural resources from which the benefits of exploitation accrue to select individuals or groups, while the costs are distributed ultimately destroying the shared resource because no parties are responsible for its well-being. In an essay in Science in 1968, University of California professor of biology Garrett Hardin pointed out, in a still more embryonic state is our recognition of the evils of the commons in matters of pleasure. He introduced a moral component to the choices about how and why we relate to nature. Today we are coming to recognize at the macro scale that our activities have tipped the balance and our lifestyles have become the endangered commodity. What was once a primarily economic and environmental equation is now a tragedy of the commoner. As climate change increases the severity of weather and patterns, weather patterns, excuse me, storm cycles and seasonal extremes, survival of consumerist society is tied to a technological nature, both beneficent, productive, and angry, destructive. In short, the environment has become a social enterprise and society an environmental enterprise. As working ecologies are increasingly integrated within the civic realm, more individuals will participate in a big nature of live content that broadens the definition of social networking to include environmental matters. For example, a recent proposal to build settlement and public terrain in New Orleans, shown here, explores this new environmentalism as a social condition. It proposes a multi-pronged strategy and encompasses diverse scales of the landscape. I'm happy to forward this project to you if you're not already familiar with it. Um, you won't have time to read through the text here. So does this genre of work simply signal a revival of second nature, the working landscape, an endemic but now technologically enhanced environment that we inhabit, tend, and depend upon for its functionality in a very real way? Or perhaps we're reaching toward a radical revision, original cultural terrain in which we grasp that we are matter too. Our performance, how we consume, how we waste, is undeniably connected to the state of the environment. So if we examine current proposals and their roots in preservation and reclamation, clearly lessons have been absorbed that provide a foundation for today's complex and preemptive big nature. There is progress towards the performative matter of public space, toward the reconciliation of nature and technology as an integrated application that is by necessity 
highly productive and socially seductive. And although critical theory has moved far beyond sustainability as a provocation, in many ways, practical practice is just embarking on it. And thus, the cultural implications are just beginning to open. For now, the forecast is that the YouTube generation, accustomed to pervasive connectivity, information habitats, and unbridled individuation, will find in these dynamic landscapes fluid modes for participation and exchange, a means to sync with ambitious social and environmental identities. We have always had a desirous relation to nature, whether agrarian or industrial, literary or aesthetic. And as our technologized culture accelerates towards big nature, bonding with it may appear to be, well, natural. So I'm going to end with a question uh, for you, for me, for all of us. Um, and this question comes up from recent discussions with colleagues surrounding big nature. And, and in these discussions, the problem of optimism was raised. Specifically, is it helpful to be hopeful? Or is big nature going to be something that simply uh, fades away in a few years? Can the productive, a state of land use, really become the socially seductive, a cultural expansion that's persistent? Will big nature backslide, ending up prioritizing either the qualitative, a kind of neo-picturesque, or the quantitative, which we saw with the most recent environmental movement of the 60s and 70s? I think, in my opinion, there is an emerging union of, clearly, of social and environmental urgency. Um, I think it will increasingly play out in a discipline of landscape that operates at a scope far more comprehensive than the conventional tropes of, of park and plaza. Um, that's been happening for a while. But it points out that professionally and pedagogically, I believe we really can't afford not to be hopeful about the potential of big nature. The potential to transform the promise of information and eco-technologies into the lifestyles that we all cherish, that are practically and theoretically sound. So is it helpful to be hopeful? And if it is, what role does big nature play in what you, the next generation of designers, uh, value in how you make and manage uh, our environments? Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions, and I understand we have a reception afterwards at which we can chat also. Okay, thank you.